Happy Halloween, everybody! And what better time of year to talk about, well, Halloween. You know, that beloved movie franchise that was originally supposed to be an anthology series, but the first movie was such a smash hit that they decided to make a sequel in order to conclude Michael Myers' story. But then when they tried to actually be an anthology series, everyone said, hey, where the heck is Michael Myers? So they brought Michael Myers back for another sequel that was supposed to set up a new killer to take his place. But then they changed their minds and brought Michael Myers back for two more sequels. But then the series wasn't doing quite as well as it used to, so they decided to make the last three movies non-canon and make a new 20 years later sequel that takes up from the second movie that was again supposed to conclude Michael Myers' story. But then the studio changed its mind again and made another sequel which nobody liked. Then Rob Zombie came along and rebooted the entire franchise from the ground up, and that movie got a sequel. But everyone preferred the original, so then Hollywood decided to make another reboot sequel, this time making all of the other sequels non-canon and just picking up from the first movie, and then that movie got a sequel. What I'm trying to say is this franchise is a fucking mess. Admittedly, though, the 2018 Halloween movie is actually pretty darn good. I didn't love it quite as much as everyone else did, but I thought the story was decent, the kills were decent, and the movie actually managed to introduce characters who I legit did not want to see die after only a couple minutes of knowing them. That's pretty impressive. One thing I did not appreciate, though, was the fact that they made the original second movie non-canon. In my opinion, that movie adds some really interesting stuff to Michael Myers' lore, plus it really racks up Michael's body count, which would actually improve these movies for reasons I'll get into later. Also, can we stop with that stupid trend of giving a sequel the exact same name as the movie it's a sequel to? That is so dumb and lazy. And plus, it creates so many stupid scenarios. Hey Dave, you want to go see Halloween? Sure, what should we watch afterwards? How about the sequel? What's that one called? Halloween! What, are we trying to start an Abbott and Costello routine here? However, as I said, I did enjoy Halloween 2018, so I was interested enough to see Halloween Kills, and I did see it in theaters when it came out. And I did not like it. In fact, I freaking hated it. I know this movie has its fans, and I can totally see why there is some good stuff in it, but I swear, this film has got to have some of the dumbest dumbassery I have ever seen in a horror film. And that does not make it more enjoyable to watch. It just makes me want all the characters to die faster. Some of you are probably wondering what the heck I'm talking about, so we'll go ahead and go into it. I should probably preface this by saying at the time of recording this, I have not yet seen Halloween Ends. Oh, you poor kid. And also, if you want to hear my thoughts real quick on this, I did do a discussion video with my raw reaction right after this film came out. But if you want to hear me really go into it and do a deep dive, let's go ahead and go into the film right now. Wait a minute. Yeah, what? How is this in any way related to mythology? Oh, well, you see, remember in The Curse of Michael Myers when they connected Michael's motivation to supernatural stuff from a pagan cult? That seems like a stretch. It still counts, though. Wait, that movie isn't canon anymore. It still counts! Wait, why are you wearing that pumpkin suit? Are you copying Nostalgia Critic? MY AUDIENCE VOTED FOR THIS! Alright. Anyway, so the movie starts out with the filthy cheater boyfriend from the last movie on his phone, when he suddenly encounters the dying police officer from the last movie, and so he starts calling out for help instead of simply using the cell phone we just saw him on earlier to call the police. Less than two minutes in and a character already did something stupid. Get used to that. We then cut back to 1978, the events of the first movie, because we're still changing up the continuity, where a younger version of that same police officer was chasing Michael Myers down an alleyway, but came upon a locked gate. Which means Michael Myers either parkoured over that gate, or he teleported. And considering later events of this movie, I'm just guessing he teleported. My mom used to make me go over to his house to play. She felt bad. But he would just spend the whole time staring out of his sister's bedroom window. I always remember thinking, the hell was he looking at up there? He was looking at Haddonfield. A simple town where nothing exciting ever happens. Yeah. Seriously? That's literally a joke from the opening of the Lego Batman movie. Night, Steve. Take it easy, Jeff. Man, I really like that guy. 
I sure hope nothing bad happens to him. Nothing bad ever happens to me. We then get another scene where a kid named Lonnie is getting picked on, and I had to be reminded that this kid is apparently supposed to be the bully from the original film, because how is it that the bully is now getting bullied on the exact same day he was doing bullying? What, what happened to his henchmen? The kid has an encounter with Michael Myers, but Michael leaves him alone, and we move on. The police officers then make the smart decision of checking if Michael is in his old house, and upon entering, they hear a suspicious noise from upstairs. So they go upstairs and split up, and then one of the officers goes into a room and lowers his gun and flashlight, then walks up to the window and just stares out it, then just stares downward, sees Michael's footprints, does not alert his partner, but just continues staring out the window while talking to himself. Haddonfield, where nothing exciting ever happened. <laughs> oh my god, this scenario was completely unavoidable. One thing I do like about this scene, though, is how the second Michael's victim dies, he immediately turns away and moves on. It really gives Michael an otherworldly feel to him. They did a good job making him intimidating here. We then get an appearance of prosthetic Dr. Loomis, which they honestly did a really great job on, and then Michael Myers gives himself up to the police. No idea why, to be honest. We know he could survive all of those gunshots. Eh. We then cut back to modern day, where a grown-up Tommy Doyle, the little kid who was being babysat in the original film, is at a bar talent show where he just gets up on the stage and starts telling everyone his sob story. Not really sure how that's a talent, it just seems like a huge mood killer. It's been 40 years, Tommy. How often do you tell this story? Before the night was over, three people would be murdered. And in the house next door, there was a babysitter and a young boy a young girl, and they were brutally attacked by this stalker who had a power beyond any mortal man. Dude, this is so awkward. You want to go to a different bar? It's also revealed that all of Tommy's friends are people who had close encounters with Michael during the first movie, because we're really trying to build up that this is some kind of revenge story. After that, the movie cuts to the fire department going to Lori's house where she left Michael trapped in a fire. And honestly, this is a part of the movie I really like. First of all, this is a sensible way for Michael to escape, because of course firefighters are going to show up. Also, the way the first two firefighters die is actually pretty tense and well done. And right after that, he goes up against the entire rest of the team. And they don't mess around. The second they see him, they start trying to kill him, as any sensible person should. Of course it doesn't work out, but I can at least root for these characters and enjoy the bloodbath that happens. So, so far so good. Even if some people were dumb enough to get offended by this scene, yeah, who would have thought a movie about a mass murderer would involve mass murder? The scene is then followed up by another killing scene where Michael goes after an innocent elderly couple, and once again, the scene is very well done. I mean, it's tense, the kills are really gruesome and interesting to watch, and honestly, I felt really bad for this couple watching them die, but at the same time, I was still having fun watching Michael be a serial killer. At this point in the movie, nothing really terrible had happened other than that stupid cop scene at that one point. It was honestly shaping up to be a really solid movie, and I was enjoying it in the movie theater. But unfortunately, the next scene is where the bad seeds start being planted. It's officially revealed on the news to everyone that Michael Myers has escaped and is on a killing spree. And while we don't get to see it, the characters in the movies get to see what Michael Myers' actual face looks like on the television, with Tommy Doyle witnessing it front and center. Now, I want you to remember that. That's going to be important later. That's a surprise tool that can help us later. Shit, I forgot my stethoscope. Come on, baby, we gotta get that home. That lady still has it. Here, I'll be right back. Ah, yes. I, too, right after finding out on the news that there's a serial killer loose in the town, would find it appropriate to send my girlfriend to the car alone in the dark in a skimpy nurse's outfit like a goddamn moron. She does survive the encounter, though, because lucky for her, that was not Michael Myers in the car. 
But at this point, you're probably wondering, hold on, what about Laurie Strode, Michael's big rival since the first film? What does she do in this film? All the marketing built her up in this movie, so we're expecting something to happen. We're expecting her to finish what she started in the last movie. Well, Laurie is in the film, in a hospital bed. Unconscious for about half the time. Oh, but she does get up at one point to go knee a random guy in the stomach and then immediately go right back to bed. And that's it. I'm not fucking with you. That's literally it. That's all she does in this movie. Am I the only one who thinks it's a big red flag when a movie feels the need to outright lie in their marketing? Lori's granddaughter then runs into her boyfriend at the hospital, and he asks her to go with him on the hunt for Michael Myers. Oh no, buddy. I saw the last movie. I saw you openly cheat on her right in front of her face at a party. There's no way she's just gonna randomly forgive you in one scene. You need to get everybody here now. Or maybe she will. Yas, queen. Hey, hey. Where's your girlfriend? Uh, she's okay. She's gonna stay with her family. Good for her. Hey, Mr. Doyle. Hey, buddy. Oh, right, check it out. You guys are coming, too. Couldn't let you have all the fun. So many victims in our neighborhood. Close friends of ours, and we just want to help out. I'm a doctor, my husband's a nurse. Oh, great. That totally makes you capable of killing Michael Myers. Also, you gotta love how none of these adults seem to have a problem with two teenagers joining the hunt for a serial killer. Tommy, you're not even gonna ask the girl's mom about it. You know her personally. Hello? Michael Myers has haunted this town for 40 years. Has he, though? You know, this brings me into something I really want to talk about. It was a huge mistake to make the original second movie non-canon. That movie added a lot to Michael that could have really been used here. First of all, in that movie, they established a motivation for Michael, which, I guess spoiler alert for that movie, it turned out Lori was Michael's long-lost sister, which is why he was after her. He killed his first sister when he was six, and he was back 17 years later to kill the other. That was his motivation, and honestly, it would have made a lot more sense why Lori over these 40 years has been so scared of him coming back, because she would have reason to know exactly why she would be the target. And not to spoil what happens later, but she's kind of not the target in this film, as it turns out, so it actually turns out all her fear over the last 40 years was kind of unreasonable and unwarranted. Also, in that movie, they increase Michael's body count, and it takes place on the same night as the first movie, meaning Michael has killed like 10 or 12 people all in one night. I can understand why the town would be horrified of him after that. One man killed 12 people all in the same night? Yeah, that would be pretty messed up. But as the continuity stands now, he killed three teenagers 40 years ago. Look, that's tragic, but... Worse things have happened in towns, so I don't understand why this whole town would be horrified of him as a result of that. I don't understand why he would have this big boogeyman reputation as a result of that. I don't get it. I mean, do you get it? Maybe I'm in the wrong here, but I really think the second movie would have added a lot to Michael to make him more interesting for these reboot sequels, whatever you call them. You know, to stand there and say Michael has haunted this town for 40 years for something that's not even as big as what several other killers have done whose towns, I don't even know if they even say they've been haunted by that guy for 40 years. So it feels unwarranted here, and it feels kind of cheap. Like, I mean, maybe you could say Michael Myers has haunted my family for 40 years, but from that talent show scene earlier, it seems like half the town doesn't even know who Michael Myers is. Just my thoughts. So then Tommy goes to a gas station where he rounds up a bunch of total strangers who are completely down to help him hunt Michael Myers. You know, as people would be. So then one of the search groups comes across some annoying kids. We're treating, we got a whole bag you guys should not be out here right now, okay? It's not safe. <laughs> you gonna kill me? No. Satan, not today. Oh, I'm so scared. Are you guys alone? Where are your parents? No. No, we're waiting for our friend. And like, there's a creepy man in a white mask, and he keeps like trying to play hide and seek with us, and he goes, he's like, he's a bird. <laughs> Where did you see him? He's just hiding behind trees. And he pops out like, King Kaboo, I mean, we're not three years old. Come on, man. Oh, look, there he is. Oh, hello. Hello! <laughs> Is that Dennis's mask? Whoa. Michael 
killed a kid. That's new. Though I still gotta ask, how is it those kids were able to see and identify that mask which isn't even facing them from so far away? I can barely see Michael from this distance. How were they able to do that? So then Michael attacks the group. Shoot him! Shoot him, Marion! Hey, Michael! This is for Dr. Loomis. When you have to shoot, shoot, don't talk. So then Michael kills one of them, and then instead of simply running away because there's no one really left around him to save, the nurse guy tries to strangle Michael with a plastic stethoscope. Oh, God. Oh, yeah, maybe it's a dumb idea to try to strangle someone while both their hands are free and they're holding a knife. His woman then tries to shoot Michael, and then we get this beautiful scene. <laughs> supposed to take any of this seriously? Ah yes, the head tilt, from back when these movies were good. One woman manages to escape though, and when the others show up they find that Michael has displayed all the bodies in a very artsy style. Now some people have highly criticized this part, calling it stupid and pointless, but I am gonna defend the movie on this because if you recall, Michael actually did do stuff like this in the very first film, so yeah, I don't really think we can fault it here. Plus, it does give us a nice little callback to Season of the Witch. Well, we located the survivor, and we know Michael Myers was just here, so we should probably GTFO and get this girl to a hospital. You stood up to that monster. I tried, Tommy. You know, when we were kids, we used to all dare each other to sneak into the old Myers house. Or we could reminisce. That's, that's also a thing we can do when a serial killer is on the loose. Lonnie was the only one brave enough to do it. I lied. I never made it inside. Ah! Cares! Tommy then goes to the hospital, where everyone is understandably a little riled up, and he uses that to rile the entire mob into trying to kill Michael Myers. Even though he openly calls him the boogeyman, I mean, no one thinks that sounds a little crazy? This ends when Michael is dead! Michael Myers will be executed tonight, and it will not go without witness! We need all of you! Evil dies tonight! Oh, you will hate that phrase by the end of this film. How did he escape? I don't know. I don't know. What do we do? We don't have the police support. We fight. We always fight. Yeah, that's right. We always fight. Oh, wait, most of those aren't canon anymore. We fought a couple of times. We then cut to a couple of gay guys named Big John and Little John. Seriously, am I supposed to take this seriously? They're currently living in Michael Myers' old house, and by the way, the movie went out of its way to point out that they know this is Michael Myers' old house, and they know what he did on Halloween 40 years ago. Remember that. I'm sorry, baby. And now they're at the back door. Halloween's over, kids! I'll handle it. Knock it off! So Michael Myers went all the way around the house in about 20 seconds. That means he's either started running or he's teleporting again. They then discover, though, that their door has been opened and there's a bloody handprint on it. Big John? Big John? Yes, little John. Someone's in our house. And it's not a child. Hmm, okay, so... It's Halloween night, we live in Michael Myers' old house, and we know that. Michael Myers' escape has been all over the news. Someone's in our house, it's not a child, and the handprint on the door is covered in blood. We're standing right next to an open door that we can easily escape through. What should we do? this 
life. I got this knife. Seriously, what is wrong with you? Why don't you just go through the door in GTFO? Why don't you call the police? Why Why would you put down your golf club and grab the world's smallest knife off the table and think that's gonna help you? You have two hands, you can hold two things. Why don't you grab bigger knives? The kitchen is right there. Call the police, leave the house. What do you think you're gonna manage to do? It's not a child. This is not a time to be stupid. Wait a minute. You live in Michael Myers' old house. Michael is on the loose. Why aren't the cops already at your place? Why haven't they at least warned you? What is going on in this stupid, 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 stupid town? Oh, yeah, and lock yourself in the house with him. That's, that's brilliant. My god. Nobody can be this stupid. But the stupidity does not end there, for back at the hospital, another escaped inmate has entered, and so everyone in the hospital, including Tommy, has decided that this man is Michael Myers. It's Michael! Michael's here! It's Michael. Michael! It's Michael! What? Why would you think that? Look, I know the guy is wearing an escaped inmate outfit, but this Peter Pettigrew looking ass guy is about three feet tall. How the hell would anyone here think that's Michael Myers, especially Tommy, and also considering the fact that Michael's picture was on the news earlier? But no, this is what we're going with, ladies and gentlemen. Everyone has decided that this tiny little rat of a man is Michael Myers because... Mob mentality is bad. We have a message. Evil dies tonight. Oh, shut up. The only thing dying tonight is all of your brain cells. We then cut back to Dumb and Dumber, who have made the decision of splitting up, as only the most genius of people do in horror movies. Then Big John gets killed, and Little John finds his body. He also sees that Michael is about 10 feet away from him, facing away from him, out the window. Now, let's present this scenario to you, the viewer. You have just come upon your lover already dead, too late to save them. You are armed with a knife, and the killer is 10 feet away from you, has not taken notice of you, and has their back to you. Your escape route is right behind you. What do you do? Do you A, run away, and get out of the house, and call the police? Or do you... B. Take advantage of the fact that the killer's back is to you and that you have a knife, so decide to rush them and try to kill them in some deluded attempt to try to avenge your dead lover. Or C. Do you simply announce yourself and then wait patiently for the killer to come to you and kill you? Guess which choice happens in this movie? <sighs> Then cut back to the hospital of the mentally inept mob where they continue chasing after Peter Pettigrew thinking it's Michael Myers. Lori easily realizes it's not Michael Myers, but absolutely no one listens to her. Yeah, don't listen to the girl who actually had encounters with Michael Myers. And also for some reason Tommy can't figure out that that's not Michael Myers. This garbage goes on for eight straight minutes and it is horrible. Every second of it is annoying, frustrating and anger-inducing, and not in some deep way, in an irritating way. Honest to God, you could have cut this entire segment out of the movie and missed nothing. It's just a whole bunch of everyone chanting, evil dies tonight, evil dies tonight, shut up, shut up, shut up, was all I could think watching this garbage. I hated every second of it in the theater, and I hated every second of it on my second viewing for this review. 
and it doesn't go anywhere. Karen tries to save the poor Peter Pettigrew man, but he just gives up and jumps out the window anyway. It meant nothing. You're trying to have some sort of deep message in your movie and it doesn't work because it relies on people being the dumbest dummies that ever dumbed in the history of dumbassery. Now he's turning us into monsters. Now, don't deflect blame. This is all on all of you. And also, monsters is too much credit. You are all idiots. Just when you think they're done with the stupid garbage writing in this movie, they actually create the absolute most idiotic motivation I've ever heard for a serial killer in any movie ever. Now, as I said, Originally, before these reboots, Michael's motivation was to kill his whole family because in Halloween 2, the twist was Lori was his long-lost sister and that's why he wanted her dead. And I think that's a great motivation. I will die on that hill. It was dumb of them to cut it out. But since they cut it out, they decided to come up with a new motivation. And my God, listen to this. It wasn't him. Let me find him then. He's after me. No, he's not. Frank! Oh. He's not. It was the doctor that took him to your house tonight. It wasn't Michael. It's not about you. He's a six-year-old boy with the strength of a man and the mind of an animal. I know. I've seen his face. I looked in his eyes when he took off his mask. Did you know that when he was a little boy, he used to stand in his sister's bedroom and... Stare out the window. My partner died. The night he stood on that same spot. And for an instant, before his death, he knew. Maybe he wasn't looking out. Maybe he was looking in. At his reflection. At himself. Who knows what makes him kill, what motivates him. But in his heart, it always seemed to me, he wants one thing. In case that wasn't clear enough for you, I'll sum it up right now. Michael Myers' big motivation in this new franchise is to go home and stare out the window. For real. Apparently that's why he killed his sister when he was six. She was in the way. He wanted to look out the window. Who cares? Let him look out the window. Just let him go stand there. Leave him alone. Why not? Make that his new prison. Lock the door behind him. I don't... Whose idea was this? Whose idea was this? This is... I, I cannot imagine how this kind of stupidity was pitched. All right, boys, we need to come up with a new motivation for Michael Myers. What was wrong with the old motivation? Nothing. That's why we're changing it. Now, come on, let's hear some ideas. Well, Michael Myers is a really important character in the slasher genre. We're gonna have to put a lot of thought into this one. Gentlemen, wait! I've got it! Oh my god! I've never seen something so compelling! He's going home. He went from Lori's compound mm -hmm. to victims in her neighborhood to the park. Okay, if you track those locations, that's a straight line. Basically an arrow pointing straight to Lampkin Lane, Michael's childhood home. I came face to face with this asshole when I was a kid. He creeps, he kills, he goes home. Lonnie, I wouldn't call your encounter with him something educational. He walked up to you, you covered your eyes, and when you opened him, he was gone. You're not some expert on Michael Myers. So then Lonnie brings the two teenagers, what a responsible parent, to the house of Michael Myers to hunt him. But then when they get there, he announces this brilliant plan. Okay, so the key is we stick together. Now I'm going in alone. Oh my god. <laughs> I can't. I can't deal with this much stupid in one movie! <laughs> How did we fall so far? We started out pretty good! Lonnie! Michael wiped out the whole fire department. What the hell do you think you're gonna do? 
Why did you even bring the two teenagers there if you weren't going to bring them in the house? What was the plan? What are you doing? What are you doing? <laughs> so yeah, Lonnie goes into the house by himself. It's a stupid idea! You're a stupid man! A stupid, stupid man! But the two teenagers do eventually follow him in. You fool! But then when they encounter the two dead gay guys, Allison puts down her shotgun. Stupid! You're so stupid! And then they split up. You fool! <laughs> They then come across Lonnie's dead body. You mean I don't get to see that moron die? I wanted to see him die! Wow, what did this movie do to me? And then they get attacked by Michael Myers. You know, I know this scene is supposed to be really tense and worrisome, like, oh no, they might die. But I want him to die. I'm so done with every single character in this movie and all the stupidity that has happened. I want dumbass actions to have consequences. I want them to die, especially the boyfriend. Kill him, Michael. Stop playing with him. Kill him. Please kill him. Michael, come on, do me this one solid. Just finish the job. Ah, oh, thank you. We then get some more cringy, stupid shit like Allison yelling, Come and get me, motherfucker, and then yelling, Do it, do it, Allison, you're not special, stop. But then apparently Karen somehow magically knew where she was. Well, okay, cool, good job, Karen. Now shove the pitchfork through his head. Or toss it to the side and just stomp on him. Yeah, lesser known fact, shoes are much more effective than pitchforks. innocent woman just like your sister was it was halloween night uh, yeah i know that karen i was there she was in her bedroom and it was right here your house already fully aware of that karen no idea why you feel the need to recite that to me but it turns out Karen has led Michael to an ambush where the town is now waiting to go full mob on him because I guess now mob mentality is a good thing. Can't even get your own message right, movie. Now, honestly, I actually really like the idea of the whole town going up against Michael. It's a clever idea. It's a good way to show that, you know, while Michael stalks a few people, they can't defeat him. Perhaps if we all rise up together, we can take him down. Though that's already been pretty sullied by that stupid hospital scene garbage you showed earlier. However, I still do like the idea of a mob going up against Michael. It's kind of reminiscent of how the Night Stalker was caught. And if you don't know that story, you gotta look it up. It's kind of hilarious exactly how that man was taken down. But yeah, we could have a potentially really cool scene where they all go up against Michael. Michael, of course, holds his own for a bit. Maybe he kills some of them, but eventually it's all too much for him. They take him down, they chop off his head, because of course, Tommy should know exactly how powerful Michael is, and so should Karen, so they should be saying, we gotta, like, chop his head off or something, or else he's gonna get back up. But unfortunately, this scene instead lends even more to the stupidity of the film. Look what these people brought to the ambush. I mean, seriously, hockey sticks, wooden boards? That woman has an iron. Where are your guns? Where are your kitchen knives? Come on, people. So they wait patiently for him to put on his mask instead of attacking him during the precious moments when he's distracted by that. But I guess I shouldn't even complain because they all just start knocking Michael around like he's absolutely nothing. Guy doesn't put up a fight at all. Really? Do you guys think this is what we want to see? Also, wait a minute. Michael can walk through a fire hose blast without even flinching, but a wooden board is enough to knock him down? Come on, you guys. Well, whatever. They've got him on the ground, so clearly they're going to finish him off now. Wait, why are you stopping? What are you waiting for? We got this, Karen. Go be with your daughter. Stop talking and kill him! <laughs> Finish 
the job, you goddamn morons! Oh my god, this is the dumbest horror film I've ever seen! You are all idiots! So, of course, Michael gets up again, and then, even though all these folks were kicking him around like a soccer ball earlier, he makes easy work of every single one of them. And he kills Tommy Doyle. And I feel nothing. I don't care about Tommy Doyle anymore. That is how low this series has sunk. I was terrified for him in the first film. I wanted him to live. I wanted him to be okay. I hate him now. I hate everyone in this town. I hate every single one of these characters except Michael. Good job, movie. You ruined everything. Anyway... So I guess while that's going on, back at the Myers house, the paramedics have shown up to help Allison, and then Karen sees an apparition of child Michael Myers in the window. Now, this house is an active crime scene, so you'd think maybe she'd say something to one of the cops or the paramedics. Hey, it looks like someone's up in that room. But no, she just walks into an active crime scene, up to the top floor, past all the blood and whatnot, and goes up to the window and stares out it like dumbasses before her. And then Michael Myers teleports into the room and kills her. whoop de frickin do Karen is dead. I don't care about her earlier. Did she have any reason at all for going into that room and staring out the window? What did she expect to find? What did she think would happen? I don't know. I don't care. The movie ends there. Fuck this fucking movie. It's such a shame. The Halloween franchise has been all over the place. And after the last movie being pretty decent, I was really hoping they could knock it out of the park with this one. But they did not. It started out good. I mean, aside, again, from that dumb cop being stupid in the flashback, there was some really decent stuff. There was good buildup. Like, I was really getting into this film, and then it just went off a cliff and got, kept getting worse and worse and worse and worse, making me angrier and angrier. This movie made me want every character to die. That is a not a good thing. That is not what you want in a horror film. If I want everybody to die, it's not horror anymore. It's just me angrily waiting for the killer to get to them already so that they can be out of the damn film. The only thing in this film that is consistently entertaining is Michael Myers. He has done well. He is intimidating. He is fun to watch. It's cool to see him tear people apart and do his thing all over the place. I like Michael Myers. I'm a huge fan of Michael Myers. I've loved his movies since I was a kid. And I still like them today, even though, you know, obviously they're dated. Like, some people could say, oh, those don't hold up very well. But other people will say they do hold up well. And we owe a lot to this franchise. This franchise is what inspired stuff like Freddy Krueger and Jason Voorhees. They came from the franchise of slashers that were inspired by this franchise. I just... Michael Myers is an important character, and... To see him in a movie that is this awful is just depressing. Look, I'm not going to pretend he hasn't been in dumb shit before. We all remember Trick or Treat, motherfucker. But that movie is entertainingly stupid. You could watch that at a bad movie night and have fun. I don't have fun watching this film. It's amazing how bad this is. And, uh, I, like I said, I haven't seen Halloween Ends yet, but I'll be sure to let y'all know what I think of that when I do see it. <sighs> this makes me want to go back and watch the original Halloween again. I might do that. It is the Halloween season. However, this isn't the worst horror film I've ever seen, and I don't think I'll be talking about that one anytime soon. I mean, honestly, the worst horror film I've ever seen takes place during Christmas. <laughs> Christmas is coming up. Huh.
Hey, thanks for watching, and thanks so much to the awesome people on Patreon who make videos like this possible. Lilith Jade Vaughn, Sage Ty, Gilda Ramos, Mr. Man, Spencer Davidson, Carrie 692 Double Ditto, Anthony Miano, CJ The Boy, Gina Adams, Justin Brown, Matthew Owen, Darkling, Gavin Lothar, Helios Fs, Justin Pruett, Zaggard, Adam, Alex, Awkward Swan, BioGeek, 932, Bloody Sovi, Bo Axe Predator, Kane Kendrick, Christopher D. Sampson II, Krill E. Dara, Dominic Fournier Bessner, Dubious, Eddie, Habalon, James H., Jeff Jeffington, Cade, Lady Aaron, Lamont Stewart, Lassie Ehrenreich, Larakia, Levi Deaton, Malice, Marco Gonzalez, Maria Potter, Miranda Annette, Mitchell Omen, Muhammad Muhammad Al Dobson, Nathaniel Frey, Orthrus, Renji Killer, Riley McGee, Robert Ray, The Jesus, and The Last Woozle, Aggie, and Mag Story. Thanks so much for all your help. If you want to become a patron, get your name in the credits, get earlier access to some videos, and be able to message me directly, the link is in the description. But regardless, thanks so much for your support, and I will see you guys next time. Bye-bye.